Log entry, the catch Scarlet Queen, Philip Carney, master. Position 112 degrees, 32 minutes east, 21 degrees, 6 minutes north. Wind light, sky fair. Remarks, departed Hong Kong, China, 9 p.m. after breakdown in schedule. Reason for delay, the jewel thieves and the straw-filled dummy. My main purpose when the Scarlet Queen slipped past Stonecutter's Island and into the teeming harbor of Hong Kong was to locate my Chinese boss, Kuji Kang, or at least to get some word of instruction for the charter voyage that had brought me all the way from San Francisco. But three days passed and I had no luck. I combed the city of Victoria from the peak to Broadway on the waterfront, but the Queen idly scraped her fenders on the dock. My crew poured their money into bar tills. My chief mate, Gallagher, threatened to sign on any ship that was going any place. And I grew more disgusted every minute at being stuck, not knowing where to go or what to do. By the end of the fourth day, I didn't care. I didn't care about anything but relaxing and forgetting. I started with a small bar on the waterfront, and by the time I'd graduated through the British Club, the Hong Kong Club, the Commercial Club, and four out of every five non-club bars I passed getting from place to place... I had almost succeeded in forgetting. I swung into the Emperor Hotel, crossed a lobby peopled by a scattering of stiff-backed crown colonists and made the doorway to the bar to look for a table. I stopped. She was sitting alone with an untouched drink in front of her. She looked up at me, her face set and cold. Her eyes flashed away for a second and back. Then she smiled stood up and came to me. Oh, darling, there you are. I've been waiting so long, I didn't know what to think. Oh? You're so late. We'll have to rush to get dressed in time for dinner. Come on, I have the key to our room. I stopped thinking it was the new Hong Kong approach when she took my arm to swing me back into the lobby. Her nails dug in, and her arm and the body behind it were shaking. The plea in her eyes gave me the rest. She was scared stiff, and she needed me. We turned around and walked out into the lobby. And so Mutual continues The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen, written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tallman, and starring Elliot Lewis. The Scarlet Queen, proudest ship to plow the seas, bound for uncharted adventure. Every week, a complete entry in the log. And every week, a league further in the strange voyage of the Scarlet Queen. She led me across the lobby without another word. Her nails still digging through my coat sleeve. Her arms still shaking. When we stopped to buzz for the elevator, I looked back. A very erect, thinly built man was coming out of the bar. His walk was mincing. He stopped by a pillar and looked at us while he put a cigarette in the middle of his mouth with graceful fingers, lit it, and flourished the match delicately to the floor. A powerfully built little five-by-five five walked up and joined him. They were still watching us when the elevator took us out of sight. was at the front of the building on the third floor. Here. She handed me the key to unlock the door. But when it closed, everything drained out of her. She slumped down on the edge of the bed. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm so frightened. I... Now, take it easy. You want to try a drink or something? A, a glass of water. Sure. Ah, here you are. Here, I'll hold it for you. Thank you. Better? Yes, I think so. Who was your sylph-like little friend downstairs? His name is Neil Gaynor. The other one, five by five? I don't know what his name is. They really knock you to pieces, don't they? Neil says he's going to kill me. Why? They were going to follow me out of the bar, and I don't know why. I swear I don't know. They want something from me, but I don't know what it is. I don't know what they've done to my husband. Where is your husband? 
Neil says he's dead. He says he's dead and I'm next. Please. Now, this is no time to cry. You're all right. I, I've no right to ask you. But could you stay with me? Please. Don't leave me. It's been my fortune to only occasionally see a woman cry as she did. Because she had to. It wasn't an act. It wasn't to gain sympathy. It was a cry of complete, terror-filled desolation. She quit shaking. A long time after that, she got up, went into the bathroom to put some cold water on her face. I'm awfully sorry for everything that's happened. I'm all right now, really. Please, I didn't have any right to ask you, and I don't want you to feel you have to stay here with me any longer. I don't. But you aren't leaving. No. Look, I was on hand when you needed me. You're bargaining? Believe me, I don't know what I'm doing. Maybe I'm taking advantage of you because you're in trouble, but if it is that, it's unconscious because I don't work that way. Maybe my world's kind of falling to pieces right now, too, and I need somebody. I'd hate to think that because I've been self-contained for a long time. You aren't going. You could make me go, or you could come with me. Where? Some place where you could forget being afraid of Neil. Some place where he wouldn't find us. Oh, we couldn't get out of here without being followed. I've been tailed through cities before. Pack your bags. I'm going to take you someplace. You're going to take me someplace? No one has said that to me for such a long time. It won't take me long to pack. I called a cab and we left the hotel by a rear door. We shouldn't have bothered. There was enough light for me to see Neil Gaynor leaning against the building. When we got into our cab, he got into one parked behind it. We want speed, driver. Turn left at the end of the alley, and I'll give you directions from then on. The driver knew what speed meant, but his idea of threading through traffic was based on the theory of the straight line, modified by the belief that the line would open through the snarl traffic ahead of it if he made enough noise with his horn. Okay. We crossed and recrossed the level sections of town with Neil and the other cab trailing in our wake. Parallel the waterfront. Dodged through a maze of warehouses. Finally lost him. We climbed halfway up Victoria Peak, took one of the terrace roads to the left, dropped to within a block of sea level. I finally shouted the driver to a stop in front of a Chinese flat. Right here, Charlie. Kim, you wee, remember me? I ain't forgot where I come. Well, D1 called Connie. The year have been many, son. Sure, it's time before me. We need a room for the lady, Kim, you wee. It is done. Her baggage is outside by the steps. My son will bring it. Oh, don't got air. Follow. Oh, ain't you not got air? Thanks very much, Kim. She crossed the room to the single window and opened the shutters to look out over the blinking, restless movement of the harbor. The maze of Kowloon's lights across the bay. And for the first time, she was smiling. Uh, they keep playing that same record over and over again, don't they? Tell me the truth. Could you tell the difference if they weren't? Certainly. I can tell the difference between one with a singer and one without. <laughs> they put you right up in my class. Feeling better? Of course I am. Your friend downstairs called you Carney? That's right, Phil. Phil Carney. You must have one too, huh? I don't want to tell you. Well, give me a phony then, tell me something. Oh, no, no, it's not that I want to hide anything from you. You just won't like it. My last name is Ainley. What Ainley? You won't like it. It's Henrietta. Oh, no. <laughs> I told you. Oh, it's all right, it's a fine name, but you becomes you like a, 
Like a diving suit would. I told you. Well, it's too late to do anything legal about it. I'll call you Hank. Oh, do you think that's pretty or... Hank? Not too feminine, but when you look like you do, they could call you Sam and it wouldn't matter. <laughs> so it's all right, huh? Sure. Everything is. Just for a little while, everything is all right. Don't talk about it if you don't want to. I think I do want to. It's simple enough, I guess. You see, my parents were killed out here during the war, and after it was over, I was all alone. Uh huh. And I married Lucian Ainley. He was good to me. I don't know what he was mixed up in with Neil. I never asked him about anything. When was the last time you saw him? That was over three weeks ago. You see, our home was in Calcutta, and he, he just left one day and didn't come back. And then I got a cable to meet him here, but when I got here, it wasn't Lucian, it was Neil. And, and I, I just don't know what it all means, because the way Neil said it, I, I think he killed Lucian. If, if I just only oh, knew... take it easy, Hank. If I knew what he was hey, from... Hey, hey, we're out of the emperor, remember? <laughs> we came out here so you could forget being scared. I'm sorry, Phil. Everything is all right. Really, it is. What's the matter, Phil? Everything's a little frightening. What, Phil? You. What happens to me? Come here, Hank. Yes? I just want your face, like this. So I can look at it. What, Phil? I wondered what makes you so beautiful. Your mouth's a little too wide. Your eyes are a little too widely spaced. Your cheekbones a little too high. They're playing that same record again. Maybe you don't like comparisons, but this is supposed to be a compliment. There's a woman who's very important in my life. Oh? You look like her. Where is she? She's on my ship. Her name is the Scarlet Queen. She's carved from wood, and she spends all her time under the bowsprit from where she keeps a good watch on what she's leading the rest of us into. You look like her. Do you mind? Uh-uh, I think it's wonderful. I think it takes care of everything that wasn't taken care of before. Phil. Oh, Phil, wait. All right, I, Phil, I... I wanted to tell you... I was scared again when you said there was a woman. I was jealous. I... I want to tell you what... What's happening to me. That... Puts you right up in my class. Oh... Then it's all right. Oh, Phil. <laughs> you and your wooden woman. After I'd got Kim Yui to put me up in a room farther away from the incessant phonograph, I lay awake. Remembering that I'd started out to forget the senseless frustration that had bogged down the voyage of the Scarlet Queen. And that I'd succeeded. Hank and I didn't move out of Kim Yui's building the next day. We spent most of our time watching the street from the window to see if our taxi dash of the night before had really shaken off her persistent friends. Nobody bothered us. Nothing did. Because there didn't seem to be anything else in the world except this dream that had picked us up out of the center of reality. That we couldn't or wouldn't leave. We went out that evening and walked, holding to the darker streets and holding hands. A light fog had rolled in to blur the lights in the harbor by the time we got back. And the foghorns were calling nervously to one another. The next morning, we hired a taxi. It followed the winding, picturesque road around to Repulse Bay. We swam in the blue water, lay on the sand in the sun, drank in the hotel bar. 
was just before sunset when we got back to Kim Yui's, climbed the stairs, opened the door, find the dream invaded. <gasps> the room had been ripped to pieces and it was cluttered by the things from her luggage. In the middle of it stood the slight, mincing man from the Emperor lobby, Neil Gaynor, his graceful fingers holding a small Japanese automatic. Ah, Tristan and Isolde, do come in. Neil... Neil, go away. Oh, I'll come to you. Will you really? The door, Captain Connor, closes, if you will. Dear Henrietta, you're actually blowing. What's happened to you? I must know. Please, Neil, give me just two hours. I promise I'll come to you. The power of man, really, the utter effectiveness of him. What has he wrought, Henrietta? Look, Nola, straighten up and say something. I'm losing my temper, and I'm going to make you kill me to keep me from getting my fingers around that dimpled throat of yours. Phil, please, please don't, Phil. What this old means is that I would put out both your eyes before you took two steps. Bang, bang. I don't see how you stand the noise. My aunt to be brave. All right, my man of action. And knowing your type, I will show you how sweetly my little one speaks. Just the tip of your right ear. <laughs> you control oh. yourself, Henrietta. Turn your head, Captain. See. Just a slow welling of good, healthy blood. Just a nick. <laughs> and another one beside the first. Now, my man of action, I hope you feel some respect for my little one. And I will leave my warning unspoken. Sit down, Henrietta. Your man will remain behind you. How much have you told him? About what, Neil? Oh, you're such a young, innocent... Aren't you? How much have you told him? I, I, I don't know what you're talking about, Neil. How could I tell him anything? Who are you trying to impress? After all, the captain shouldn't mind if you're only a few hundred thousand pounds sterling outside the law, should you, captain? As long as you're enjoying yourself. I don't know what you're talking about, Neil. How interesting. You mean the disposal of jewels valued at 200,000 pounds was too unimportant to be discussed in your home? Neil, do you mean my husband? I do indeed, and you know it. Lucian Ainley and the brilliant robbery of the Hemelian Transport Company. You believe it, or you wouldn't have flown so rapidly to Hong Kong after my cable tour. I was worried about Lucian. You were worried about the jewels. Where is Lucian? He is dead, oh. my dear. And you and your captain will be also, unless you tell me where the jewels are. Neil, I don't know anything about them. Lucian never told me anything. Believe me, I, I don't know. I really... Neil, Neil, what are you doing? Sit still. Neil. If you tell me the same story for 40 minutes, I'll try to believe you. I'd moved two inches closer to the chair while he backed halfway across the room. He had a thin leather belt in one hand and he held his automatic in the other. Just as his arm went back and he was briefly off balance, I dropped to my knees behind the chair, grabbed the legs and threw everything. Chair, writhing girl, and my 210 pounds on him all at the same time. I stumbled across Hank in the tangle, sprawled forward into Neil's legs just as his automatic snapped. I got my feet under me, pulled him partway up by his hair and one shoulder, and gave him my right knee. I heard his breath leave him. When the pain doubled him up, I hit him just above the chin with my right... I got to my feet, lifted Neil by his clothes. I took him out of the room. I stopped at the head of the stairs. And I tossed him down. Phil. Phil. What's the matter with you? Oh, are you all right? Sure, I'm all right. Oh, hold me, Phil, please. Hold me. Yes. Did he hurt you? Not very much. The devil he didn't. Phil, could we go someplace else? You mean five by five might show up now? Oh, I think so. And we aren't going anyplace else. We'll wait for him. Go get some decent clothes on. Do something with your face. You're a mess. We didn't have to wait long for our next visitor. When I heard his footsteps on the stairs leading to our floor, I hustled Hank into a corner where she'd be out of sight. I waited at the door with Neil's automatic. A funny approach, and for a split second, I had the crazy hunch that it wasn't five by five. The hunch was right, it wasn't. Strip! What the devil happened to you? Gallagher, what are you doing here? Well, I, I came up to talk to, to talk to you. What do you want, Red? Oh, I just wanted to talk to you. Don't you think this vacation has gone on long enough? What do you mean? I just want to know if you're going to turn into a Hong Kong playboy or come back to the ship, that's all. I think the least I deserve is the truth, don't you? Yes, Well, dear. I'm not thinking about myself. I'm thinking about the boys in the crew. 
After all, they're as much your responsibility as mine, and I'm not... Well, you... Can you come out here so I can talk to you? Yeah, sure, Red. What? Some dough was delivered to the ship for you and sailing orders from Kang. Did you open them? They were open. The next port's high farm. I was thinking if you want to stick around for a while and come down by land, I could take the queen down. Well, it's none of my business. How'd you with... find me? Through the police. You're mixed up with some nice hot company this time. I know it, Red. They got their clamps ready for your... your girl. And I'd like to see you get out before they shut. They've had their fingers on every move you've made since you met her. You're in deep enough, Scott. All right, Red. All right, gather the crew. We'll sail at nine tonight. <laughs> Had a boy, Skipper. There are plenty more like her where we're going. Yeah. What? What is it, Phil? Come here, Hank. Sit down. Is this goodbye, Phil? You just tell me if it is. What if I told you that Red was taking the ship and that I was going to stay here? Oh, that it'd be bad for you and good for me. And we'd make it somehow. What about that 200,000-pound bundle of jewels? Would it make any difference, Phil? No. Now, what if I told you that the police here in Hong Kong were absolutely sure that you do know where the jewels are? Phil, that's impossible. Unless Neil made a sworn statement out of his suspicions. It's true, Hank. They're ready to take you. I... Listen, if I could draw the police away from you and give you a break... You would... draw the police away from me. You wouldn't take the break? With you drawing the police? What kind of a break would that be with you in danger for no reason at all? Phil, why are you saying all these things? To get to the real way out and to make it sound as simple as it really is. The Scarlet Queen is sailing tonight at nine and you're going with her. Oh, I could go with you. You see how simple it is? Oh, I... it's with you. That's all I can see. It's the way out, Hank. We'll figure the rest when it comes up, okay? Oh, okay. How can I answer that? How can I answer a question as big as my whole life? Just say sure it's okay and shut up. You better just shut up and come here. Everything's going to be all right now, darling. Isn't it? I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of anything. You have to leave a lot of your stuff. That's all right. You can only take one bag. I'll take it down to the ship right now. Oh, you're going to leave now? I have to, Hank. I have things to take care of. Oh, yes, yes, I know you do. Yes, and you'll be back when? I'll pick you up at 8.30. Phil. Oh, Phil, hurry back. I've gotten so used to you. About three hours, darling. We can handle that, can't we? I don't know. Hold me, Phil. Oh, yeah. Three hours. I don't know if I can get through them or not. I took her one small bag with me when I left. I got down to the waterfront without being followed and took her bag into a dive. And drank my way through the longest three hours of my life. I had to do it this way. I'd asked her if she'd let me draw the police away and she'd refuse, so I had to leave her. I had to do it my way. A quarter after eight, when she was counting the last 15 minutes to the time when we'd be together, I made an anonymous phone call to the Hong Kong police. In a quarter of nine, I staggered drunkenly aboard my ship, carrying in my arms a straw-stuffed dress. At the end of the pier, I saw the police I'd called. I walked a little slower, and then I saw him, the squat figure of five by five skulking in the lee of a warehouse. And I knew that in the mist, the object in my arms would pass very well to all of them as... Henrietta Hank Ainley on her way to High Farm. We know 
rose slowly out of the fog-blanketed harbor, crept past the invisible Stonecutter's Island, and turned south into the steady roll of the South China Sea. The wind we picked up outside swirled gray dampness across our decks and rattled the running rigging. Stand by to make sail! The miserable crew moved sullenly to their stations at the halyards. This foggy departure meant nothing to them. They hadn't known Hank Ainley. What's The main sheet moved sluggishly up the mast, and the moisture that clung to it gleamed dully in the faint glow of our running lights. In the jib sheets, man! Smartly now! Red tried his best, but the men moved like martyrs to a lost cause. And the jibs moved out, and the mizzen. The Scarlet Queen groped her way into the fog. That's a bad night, Skipper. But not much shipping down this way. I guess we don't have to worry too much about collision. Do you think so? Oh, c- come on, Skipper. Pull out of it. <laughs> What'd you do, fall in love or something? Shut up! Uh, Get out of here, Gallagher. Leave me alone. Uh, hey, Skipper, climb off. What did I do? Nothing, Red. Nothing. Look at you! What's the matter with me? You got us two points off course and the mainsail is starting to flutter. That proves she wasn't good for you. Oh, look. You already got one lady in your life. That scarlet beauty under our bowsprit. Log entry. The Catch Scarlet Queen. 11.30 p.m. Miles traveled from San Francisco, 11,047. Dense fog. Wind light. Sail reduced because of bad visibility. Ship secured for night. Signed, Philip Carney. Master. Voyage of the Scarlet Queen has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.